Welcome back to the Metal Exchange. Justin and Chris here with you for another week. How's it going, bud? Very good. I am super excited to uh, talk about this week's album. Yeah, uh, this one, This one. I think we're going to have a lot of uh, stories to tell. Um, spoiler, it's, it's an album that I've probably listened to more than the other ones that we've uh, talked about maybe combined. That's how much I've actually played this album, but we'll get to that in a minute. Um, anything else that you heard this week that, uh, struck a chord with you? Uh, I have been trying to catch up with a lot of the, like recent releases of the last month or two. So, um, this week I was able to listen to, um, just listen to the new pain of salvation album. I listened to the new Terra maze album, which I really enjoyed, uh, the new enslaved, which was excellent on your recommendation. Um, I checked out uh, Malifistum, which is a band that has, um, you know, we're going to bring her up again, uh, Melissa Bonnie from Ad Infinitum, um, doing a lot more uh, death vocals. So that was really, I enjoyed that a lot. That was really cool. And, yeah, her um, versatility is incredible. Yeah, it's, it's, um, it's, it's amazing. Incredible. Yeah. And um, I checked out um, a friend of mine on uh, Facebook, Jeff Taft, is uh, is in a band called Adamantis. I believe they're out of the Boston area. I gave their uh, album a whirl today, and I, en- I enjoyed it quite a bit. Um, also listened to the new Defecto album on your recommendation, which I really enjoyed. Very cool stuff. Yeah, they got a different sound. And I think I mentioned this uh, briefly when I, when I spoke about them, uh, whether it was last week or a couple of weeks ago now. They have kind of like a unique, almost like a modern metal type of feel to it. I, I, tough to describe, but they just, it's so melodic and, and so catchy that the songs just stay in my head. And I think that's part of the reason that I love them. Yeah, the vocals definitely uh, reminded me of M Shadows from Avenged Sevenfold. Um, okay. I definitely was getting like an Avenged Sevenfold vibe. Definitely more of a melodic style of Avenged Sevenfold, but really enjoyable album. And I kind of capped off the day uh, listening to the new albums from Fate's Warning, Jeff Scott Soto, uh, Lords of Black, and Eternal Idol, which is uh, a Fabio Leone project. Um, And I enjoyed uh, all those albums. I I really enjoyed the Jeff Scott Soto album. I feel like um, you really can't ever go wrong with anything by him, and, and same goes with Fate's Warning as well. Yeah, I, 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 it's funny. I, I didn't get to listen to very much this week myself, um, but I, I think I played I played Angels Cry so much that I was looking for a real change of pace. So I, I kind of dug into the archives a little bit, and I pulled out a, an album from 2016 that I hadn't heard um, in at least a year or two, and it's a, by a real obscure band called Trees of Eternity. I'm not even sure if you're familiar with this. It's the guitar player from Swallow the Sun and and a South African singer. Her name was Aaliyah Stanbridge, and she recorded the album and unfortunately passed away before it was actually ever released to the public. But after her death, they released the album with her vocals. And it's, uh, I guess I would describe it as like gothic doom metal. Um, Definitely slower paced, definitely uh, gothic haunting type uh, sounds in the back. And, And she does the bulk of the vocals on the disc. Really, really good stuff and a, and a nice change of pace to, to Angel's Cry, I have to say. So it was nice to check that out. I'll, I'll put up links uh, during the week to that album just because it's it's a little bit more obscure. Um, but a really, 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 really good disc and, and highly recommend it as well. I thought you were going to say you like put on Nirvana or something. You yeah, no, that, that 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 would be that would be a stark contrast. And since we're going back to '93, I guess it would actually be appropriate. Um, but that being said, let's 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 get into the reason why we're here. Angels Cry, 1993. Um, how did you first hear this? Uh, well, I mean, it's funny you should say the reason why we're here. I mean, this album is quite literally part the of the reason, reason why, why we're, we're here. here. Um, I. My first anger album was Holy Land. Uh, I had heard Carolina the Fourth was the first anger song I ever heard. In fact, I remember it vividly. Ralph, uh, our friend Ralph, playing it for me on my stoop outside of my house on Long Island growing up and just being like, you have to hear this. And this was before the fabled mixtape became uh, part of our lives. And sure. I just remember thinking like, wow. This is this is cool. So when I did get that mixtape, uh, Carolina the Fourth was on there, and so I had gotten uh, Holy Land first. That was my first Angra album, and I had heard 
uh, carry on and, and some of the, well, probably just carry on really, um, was probably the first song from angels cry I had heard. Um, and it was just one of those albums that I have eventually, I might've even got fireworks before I got angels cry, but, um, it, it, it wasn't until later on that it really dawned on me, like how much I really enjoy this album. I was always, I always would say Holy Land was my favorite Angra album. Um, we're we're going we're gonna to get there. And before before we get to the comparisons, because I definitely uh, <laughs> I, I definitely want to talk about that. Um, do you do you remember like when I guess you said you got it after Fireworks, which is kind of interesting that you went from Holy Land to Fireworks and then delve deeper into the back catalog to get Angra's first release. Right. Well, at the time, there only were the three albums as far true, as like true. the full length releases. So it was kind of like a next logical step is to just get that one of the three that was, was missing. I, I, I want to, I feel like I, it was definitely one of those like random online stores, probably like CD now or something similar to that. I remember getting it. And, um, I remember our friend Mike having the, uh, the angels cry, Holy land dual disc where, and he had like that weird one where they accidentally put the wrong album on each disc so his yeah his holy land disc had the angels cry on it and vice versa it's funny you mentioned that shout out to snowdy friend of the show <laughs> um the, the the i remember i remember ordering this vividly the two disc version from cd now and when i say two disc i mean just what you said it was a it was a release with angels cry on one disc and holy land on the other and at the time i was only familiar with a couple of songs off each album and I was I, I saw that CD now, which is really a precursor to Amazon. Uh, you know, the, the CD now obviously hasn't been around for twenty years, but CD now was where you would you know probably the number one place to get a CD online in the mid to late nineties before Amazon ultimately took them over. And I remember seeing the double disc, and I said to myself, I, I had to have it, so I bought them. And I think that when I got them, I, I'm not sure that I listened to anything else. <laughs> for for like weeks afterwards. Now, to be fair, this was obviously a time where music was not coming out as rapidly or with as many bands as we see now. I mean, on a, on a typical Friday, you could have six or eight discs easily that 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 come out that I you know I'm curious and I want to hear. Then you'd probably get you'd be lucky if it was one a month, just because the volume of bands wasn't wasn't nearly as great as it is now in in these types of genres. But I remember I remember getting the double CD. And, and it's funny, I put on I put on Angels Cry first, and I vividly remember I vividly remember the introduction or, or, or the first track to the disc. And it's you know, they called it Unfinished Allegro, and 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 obviously it's a testament to, to Schubert's Unfinished Allegro, uh, the classical piece, but I didn't know it as that. I actually first heard that song in a video game, all kidding aside, before I had Nintendo. Do you remember in television? Sure. Yeah, I, I had in television. I may be one of the few people that actually had in television. And I remember my parents getting me a game called Thunder Castle. Um, I, I doubt you've played it, and I'd be shocked if most people here. I mean, you got to really be kind of a hardcore gamer to be into that game. But the game had, for, for its time, one of the most incredible soundtracks. And Unfinished Allegro was in the game. So when I heard the beginning of Angels Cry, I, I immediately thought of my childhood. And I'm like, I know this song. I didn't, didn't know Schubert, but I knew that I knew I had heard this song in Thundercastle. So I, right off the bat, I was impressed that I like, I don't know, that there was like this connection to my childhood. And then obviously the second that Carry On, you know, probably the most iconic track uh, on the album, you know, kind of kicks into high gear you know, I, I'm blown away at this point. And, and it's funny because as we get a little bit deeper into the tracks, I'd have to say that at this point, it's probably one of my least favorite tracks on the album, just because I played it so many times over and over again. I got a little tired of it in the grand scheme of things. Still a great track and Angra classic, but there's so many other deeper cuts on here that are just so good that I think it, over time actually lost something on me. Do you, do you feel that way or is it just me? The exact thought crossed my mind as I was listening to the album. I mean, I still love the song. I mean, it is just like a power metal powerhouse track. salvo. Like, yeah, it's just like, well, here we go. Like, um, it's just a fantastic song, but yeah, I agree with you. Like I'd, 
arguably rather hear possibly any other song on the album just because I've heard every other song on the album significantly less um, over the years. Um, but yeah, I totally get that. Like I would, I would venture to say carry on's the most well-known song on the album. Um, if not the most well-known anger song. Yeah. That, I mean, that's fair as well. Um, I'm, I mean, I'm pretty sure that like Alma um, were they, Oh no. Were they still, were they playing carry on on their shows or am I thinking of when, um, Edu was in Angra. I, I might be uh, probably both. Yeah. I, I don't. I don't remember if Alma did it, but I know Shaman was doing it when 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 Matos, you know, ultimately left Angra and formed his own band. I know that they were playing Carry On. It's just it's just such an iconic track that I think everybody was playing it. It's it's just the go to track. I mean, I may be a little sick of it, but that's just because of a testament to how great it is. Really, right? I mean, and I wouldn't complain hearing it live performed sure. by anybody for that matter. Um, I, w- I will say um, to kind of piggyback from what you were saying about uh, Schubert's unfinished Allegro that they used to open up the album. Um, I, I, it, it just, I don't know. And I never really stopped to think about it and it just dawned on me like how, how much um, orchestral music ha- like has a part in this album. And this is before, this is in 1993. So like this is before, you know, bands like Nightwish are hitting it big. Like you're not really seeing a lot of symphonic metal. And I never really, I guess I never really thought of Angra as like a symphonic metal band, but this is definitely a symphonic album. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's power metal at its core, but the, 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 the symphonic and classical influence is all over this disc. I mean, it's all over. I mean, simply put, it's all over this disc. There, there are, um, nods to, uh, orchestral music invert almost every track some a little more obscure than others for sure but i mean take take a listen to the 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 beginning of lasting child the last song on the disc Uh, you know it's it's or the outro for that matter which is like the last three minutes of the song it's all inspired by orchestral music and in some cases taken directly from you know orchestral discs and, and and other uh you know other other songs of that ilk yeah, without a doubt. I mean, um, the orchestrations, you know, I, I thought it was so interesting. Like I was, I was, uh, I just took a quick look at Wikipedia and, and there was a, something that Andre Matos, the lead singer of Anger, who I know we're going to discuss at, at length, but um, he said that uh, the recording of the album was difficult due to the inexperience of him and the, and the rest of the band and due to the difference of musical influences uh, between them and the producers, like I, I almost re- read that quote and was just like, wow, that's kind of incredible that they were able to, I mean, this is their debut album. Um, they put together quite, quite an album considering that, you know, they were inexperienced and, and they were not, you know, they didn't have the same artistic vision as the producer, let's say. So, I mean, and, and you could tell like, there something about this album, like every song is, is so different from the last, yet they all flow into each other so so perfectly like it's it's really just a testament to to what a just what an unbelievable job they did putting this together yeah it's it's funny i i didn't realize that uh ricardo confessori actually doesn't play drums on the album i just assumed because he's kind of you know in the pictures and whatnot that he's you know part and parcel to this album but they actually had to bring in uh, Alex Holsworth to play drums because whoever was in the band at the time, I guess really just, I think his name was Marco Atunes. He apparently was, they were, there were questions as to whether or not he could play the complexities that were in some of these songs. So they brought in Alex Holsworth as a hired gun, um, as a session musician, just to play the track. So I didn't know that he was actually the drummer on this. And to be honest with you, I didn't realize that Kai Hansen did the solos and never understand, which is one of my favorite songs on the disc. Um, you know, track number six, he does lead guitars on this, which again, going back to 1993, there really wasn't any bands that sounded like this. I'm not sure how they hooked up with, with Kai Hansen, but I, I found that very interesting as well. Well, it, uh, the album was recorded at Kai Hansen's studio um, oh, in Germany. It. So okay. I'm, and, and it was pr- uh, produced in part by Sasha Paith. Uh, so uh, he, he's got his fingerprints on, on, the the european metal world going back even to 
1993. But yeah, this was this was recorded um, at the Hanson Studios in Hamburg. So um, that's probably why Kai was involved. But um, I kind of noticed that like back then, it just seemed like all of these bands were aware of each other and helping each other out and doing guest vocals. And I think of like Hansi doing guest vocals on Ed Guy's uh, Vainglory Opera. Like it, it just felt like it was kind of like this brotherhood where guys just wanted to help out the new guys. Cause there just weren't a lot of these bands out there. I mean, when you think about back in 1993, I mean, you know, your, your Sonata Articas aren't really a band yet and stuff like that. You're just talking about like, you know, Stradivarius and Angra and, you know, some of these bigger names like Camelot hasn't really hit it big yet. Um, Labyrinth hasn't hit it big. I mean, no, no, none of the, none of the stalwarts from the, the late nineties, had really hit it at this point. They were they were few and far between. Right. So I do think that there was, I don't know, more of a closeness, I guess. I mean, the band is from Brazil. So for them to fly out to Germany to record the album, I mean, obviously, I, I would imagine that they believed it, it, in them enough to be like, why don't you come out here and do that, you know, based on the, uh, the demo that they put out. And um, I just have to say, like, I'm surprised it's taken us this long to bring it up, but... Um, the passing of Andre Matos recently um, was just so like he was well, he was one of the first metal vocalists I ever heard and remains to this day one of my all time favorites and it just stinks so badly that um, I'll never get to to see him sing live and listening to this album it's just him at his absolute peak of as a vocalist um, you turn on a song like Wuthering Heights and you hear the oh way that God. he sings that song, this, this ballad kind of, uh, it's a Kate Bush cover, but like, I remember the first time I heard this song in high school it was one of the first anger songs I heard. And I just remember like, like, I can't believe that's a man singing that right now. Yeah, I mean, I, I, the notes that he hit are, uh, it's just, it's not, it's, 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 it's beyond comprehension, I think is the way I would describe it. And I was going to say that there's two things that really stood out to me on this album as a whole. One was Matos's vocals, and two was the, the, the dual guitar attack um, of Bittencourt and Lorero. Uh, Bittencourt and Lorero, and I'll, I'll get to that in a second. But let me let me just go back to Andre Matos for a second. I've been fortunate enough to basically see almost every band on my bucket list. I have never and will never get to see Andre Matos sing live. And that to me is devastating. He passed away so young. He passed away um, last year and he, and he passed away so young. And much like Halloween had done the reunion show with all of their vocalists, I was just hoping and praying that you were going to get a show with Fabio and Edu and Andre and that they were going to do the full production uh, live and and it just unfortunately it, you know it, it wasn't in the cards but he to this day is, is one of my favorite vocalists of all time just because of some of the stuff that he did on this album was never ever touched by anyone again um when i heard this album i had to go back and buy all of his vipers to the two albums that he did with viper um the band that he was in before angra and then i wound up buying all of his cameos and appearances that he was on you know throughout his career just because if i i knew there was a song that he sang i wanted to hear his rendition of it i remember buying a japanese import of a superior album i think it was unique just to hear him sing why off of one of superior's earlier albums because he was singing on it i remember buying luca Turilli uh b-sides so that i could hear andre matos sing on those discs uh, he was on an old Time Machine album, and I know it sounds like I'm name dropping, but the reality is he had such a profound impact on my listening experience that I immediately just became a fan of everything he touched. And everything he touched was gold because he had such a fantastic voice, let alone his his proficiency on the piano. And let's not uh, forget that he was a runner up to replace Bruce Dickinson in Iron Maiden which tells you everything you need to know. And that was, you know, obviously uh, 
I mean, that's, I think, just another testament to how, how great he was and, and, and how much he will be missed. 47 years old when he, when he passed yeah. away on June 8th of last year. That's it's, such a shame. Just- and, and, and I mean, I could only imagine, you know, I, I will say um, a little personal anecdote for me that I had in the, you know, between 2000 and 2010 had kind of, kind of lost my lost touch with metal. And after I, you know, graduated from college and, you know, I had gone to uh, Prague Power 3 with you to see Angra play in the United States for the first time. And that was with uh, Edu at the helm. And they would they, they did sing, you know, Carry On and some of the, the Andre era classics. And it was amazing to see them. But, you know, there is a part of you that, you know, wishes that you were seeing Andre Matos. Um, sure. But I mean, I'll say this. Part of the reason or a big part of the reason that, you know, a poor college student like myself ventured down to Atlanta, Georgia was to see Angra. The whole lineup was fantastic, but that the Angra was one of the big draws to me because I just couldn't believe that they were playing in the United States. And even though, and, and again, Edu is a very good vocalist in his own right, but Andre is, is, is the pinnacle of, of power metal in, in my eyes. Right. And so I hadn't been to Prague power again for seven years after that Prague power. And, and one of the reasons that I decided to go back was that Andre Matos was going to do a solo headline show uh, at Prague Power 10 in 2009. Right. And, right. Uh, and I was like, I'm coming back. I'm coming back to Prague Power. I got my ticket. And it just so happened that there were visa issues, which became a lot more prevalent later in later years. But at the time, that was kind of unusual for four bands to drop off the lineup in one year. Uh, but much to my chagrin, uh, Andre Matos' solo set was one of those ones that fell off. But um, I still went to that Prague Power, and my love of metal was completely rekindled that weekend. And I've been to every Prague Power since then, and I've just I've listened to more new music this past year. Every year, it's a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. So in a lot of ways, like. I could say Andre Matos. I never got to see him live, but he brought me back into the family, so to speak. I I totally get that. And and to your credit, I think you've also expanded your horizons. Um, You mentioned Enslaved earlier. It's probably not a band you would have listened to 10 years ago, uh, you know, prior to to at least thinking you were going to see Andre Matos uh, perform live. So I I, I totally, totally understand that. You know, I, I have fond memories of actually getting off the plane um, when, when we were going to go see them, um, I, I, we flew down on our Friday morning and I remember getting to the airport, going to, or, or taking the, the public transportation, the MARTA to the hotel where we were staying. And I remember checking in and I remember seeing Kiko Lorero on a couch in the lobby of a hotel with his guitar. And for someone, you know, again, it's, it's 2002, these bands are not touring the United States on a regular basis. And there's Kiko Lorero playing a guitar, albeit not plugged in, but he's playing an electric guitar and you can hear it uh, as I'm checking into the hotel. And I'm like, where am I and what is going on? And that was just one of the most profound things. He was the nicest guy that I had ever uh, you know, met, or at least up until that point. And, and, and that just stuck out to me how he clearly wanted to in, ingratiate himself and really embrace the fans that were coming from all over the world to see Angra that weekend. And, and obviously his career is now blossomed. He's playing with Megadeth. Um, and that'll, that'll lead me into my second point. The, 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 the guitar work on this album may not be as um, polished, if you will, as it became in later years with Holy Land and even um, some of the, the Edu albums that both Kiko and Raphael were, were on together. But, but, you could, but you want to talk about a virtual, a virtuoso tandem. I would put those two up against anyone. That's how good they are, literally, as, as a tandem. Can you think of two better songwriters and guitar players than those two? Uh, other than Kai Hansen and Michael Wycath, not really. I mean, that, yeah. that's what I think of when you say like the dual guitar attack. Like you could tell that they definitely drew some inspiration from those Keeper of the Seven Keys albums of that. You know that power metal staple but i mean i feel like they took that that halloween power metal formula and they turned it on its head by just sprinkling in all of this this symphonic and orchestral 
stuff uh, and it's I, I mean I, I this I, I I just have no lack of of positive things to say about about everything angels cry like just uh, it's just really such a, a fabulous uh, I, I I've listened to it God knows how many times over the years and it was a treat getting to listen get to it it doesn't get old you know I, I I because I know this album so well I'll be honest you suggested it and I was so happy to go back and listen to it although it's still in regular rotation. I got, I have to be honest with you, but I, I wanted to, I, I had every intention of listening to it once and then, and then jumping on to do the podcast with you. I listened to it three times this week. So now I guess I've listened to it a thousand and three times just <laughs> because I've, I've, I've played it so many times. And, and at least for me at one point or another, I think every song has been my favorite. And I think that that's actually a testament to how strong the album is. Um, it, it starts obviously with carry on as we had discussed I think Time is one of their most underrated songs. And, and I think that it's a song that really just, it, it, which just shows the melodic side of the band. Also, I think that- shout out to Theocracy for uh, busting out an unbelievable cover of Time last year, uh, both in the studio and then um, played it live at Prague Power as a, as a replacement band, by the way. Um, yeah. I That was such a treat. And, and coming so soon after Matos' passing, it was just... Uh, no pun intended, but very timely. Yeah, and I'll say that. I'll say this. It takes a lot of guts, <laughs> not only to play an Angra cover, but to try to cover Andre Matos' vocals. So shout out to Matt Smith. Uh, un- unbelievable job there. So so kudos to you guys and and, and, and that. Um, fantastic song. The, the, the title track, maybe the best this maybe the best song on the entire album um and and i think it's a song that they've actually played live with with fabio i've yet to hear it but i i i i i would imagine it's incredible and then from there you then we start getting into some of the more ballady uh type songs with like the beginning of stand away it's just every single song is just better than the next and and depending on your mood i could see any one of these songs becoming your favorite off the album do do you have and i'll let you do the honors uh, being that you picked the album this week, what what is your pick if if somebody's going to listen to one song of this album? And good luck. Yeah, I mean, I'll tell you, I'll tell you something very funny. When I met my good friend Amy, and I was uh, trying to get her into metal, I would make her all of these like best ofs, you know, best of Sabaton and best of Sabotage and best of Stradivarius. And when I came to Angra, I I just burned her a copy of Angels Cry. <laughs> Because <laughs> there you go. I mean, yeah. I, I to me it was like, what? How am I supposed to make a best of? Ang- I I literally gave her a copy of Angels Cry and Holy Land, and it was just like, just start there, and you know, you'll be fine. Um, yeah, so yeah. that that should should tell you, like, I, I I don't even know. I mean, I gotta tell you, like, same with you. Like, probably at at some point in time, every song on this album was my favorite. I'm sure Carry On was my favorite at the beginning. I think. Absolutely. time is has been my favorite at times um i in recent years i have absolutely um i i think we talked about this on a previous episode where you just kind of like a song just kind of gets lost in the shuffle because of everything else that's going on there's so many other great songs but evil warning is such a fabulous fantastic song that like i just never really gave it it's it's just do until recently the last couple of years it just kind of like maybe i just like was going back and listening to angels cry for like the 97th time and it just was i was just like wow like this is really standing out to me how good of a song this is um but if i had honestly if i had to pick one i i go at lasting child the last track on the album really i was not expecting that not that it's not a great track i i just uh, it surprises me because some of the other ones I think are a little bit tighter. Although obviously lasting child is a fantastic song in and of itself. It's really two songs in one. I just wasn't expecting, expecting you to say that. Um, good choice. And, and I, I think that that really does bring out more of the symphonic side of the band for sure. And, and I think that that is an interesting choice. Well, I, you know, it brings me back to when, 
Timo Tolki started a band called Symphonia and it was kind of like the super band that he created. And he had Andre Matos as the vocalist and Uli Kush from Halloween was the drummer and Miko from Snada Arctic was the keyboard player. So it was all named guys. And I just remember seeing on YouTube a clip of them doing a version of Lasting Child. And I'm thinking to myself, man, of all the Angra covers, they went with Lasting Child. And like I sat down and listened to it and it has like Timo Tolki on backing vocals. And I'm just like, I think it just like brought that song back to my attention after so long. And and ever since then, it has just been like just an absolute favorite of mine. So that's kind of how that all right. Good, good choice. I I, uh, I look forward to listening to uh, again this week. Um, I'm going to go in a little bit of a different direction. And and normally I have a track or two picked out uh, that that I would choose as as, as the one. And and, if, and I take two just because in case you select the other one and, and we don't discuss this before we record. But if 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 you're going to take my track, I want to have something else to fall back on. Um, this one you could you might as well take. The, the nine songs, if you will, and, and close your eyes and, and, and throw a dart at a dartboard. But I, I'm going to go with the title track. Uh, it was really, I guess, between that and Never Understand. So if I can cheat and pick two, listen to the listen to both and then listen to the rest of the album. But, but there's something about the title track that I just really think encapsulates this entire, entire disc. So we'll, we'll, we'll put up both uh, Lasting Child and Angels Cry um, throughout the week. And anyway, we, we invite you to, uh, listen again or listen for the first time. Um, so I'm, I'm going to go with the title track. No, it's a but, great, it's like, I mean, you really can't go wrong with anything. And I think at least me speaking, I think you're probably going to see a bit more, uh, stuff uploaded on our social media this week, because there's a lot of really cool versions of, of a lot of these songs that I just would love to, to kind of share with everybody. Um, there's a version of stand away that Angra did uh, at the angels cry. I believe it was the 20th anniversary show with, uh, with right. Fabio and Taria doing operatic vocals back and forth. It is like goosebump inducing. It is yeah. just an amazing thing to see. Um, I love the acoustic version of um, never understand and Angels Cry, funny enough that you mentioned those two songs on this uh, rare uh, ac- little three-track acoustic disc called Live Acoustic at FNAC that Anger recorded in France. Um, I love like the use of like bongos and just like the, the acoustic version of Never Understand is super cool. And that is such a such a great song. Um the speed version of Weathering Heights that they did on the yeah. on the Reaching Horizons demo, um, it just there's unreal. It, yeah, it's, and, uh, it's unreal. And 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 even with the different arrangements, it's like it's like listening to a different song, especially those acoustic tracks that you mentioned. But they're just, I mean, it, it's just it's mind blowing. And, and and I think that um, if you if you if you are familiar with the disc, and obviously it's something that you've heard, but you've never heard some of these. Uh, other renditions uh definitely definitely give us a follow on social media just because we will be pumping this stuff out to you guys uh and gals uh i i just think that um you're missing out if you haven't heard these other versions so and i guess while i'm giving the plug if you won't mind if you wouldn't mind give us a like give us a uh give us a five star review if we've earned it and uh definitely uh we can appreciate we appreciate the love and support because uh it kind of expands our growth and, and really gives other people a chance to uh find us that might otherwise not have um but for your support so thank you for that and uh we'll we'll, we'll pump the stuff out to you guys so you can so you can hear it this week and, you know it was funny i kind of went down the anger rabbit hole uh, as you know you're probably going to do after listening to an album like this. And um, there's a song and it was originally written and recorded. uh, I would imagine around the time of angels cry because it's on the, their reaching horizons demo from the year before the album was released. And it's a track called, um, called reaching horizons. And it's on the, uh, the freedom call EP. And I listened to it today and it it would have fit in perfectly with the rest of carry on it's just a really beautifully like orchestral 
Angra song. So I don't know if that deserves to be in a discussion about Holy Land or Angels Cry or or just fits somewhere in between. But man, what a what a just fantastic song. Like they these guys were just pumping out like absolute kill like killer song after killer song. I mean I think they were actually a victim of the I, I think that Fireworks, their third disc, is great, but because the first two albums were just so fantastic that it doesn't get its just due. And, and it, it, it's clearly not as good as the first two. I think most people, if not everyone, would agree with that. But it's not that it's not a good album. It's just that these first two albums were so iconic that it was hard to top. And in many cases, I don't think they ever were able to, despite having good album after good album and, and a lot of great albums uh, in there as well. It's just these first two Anger albums were, were to me... Um, just just genre defining i mean last week i I talked about some of uh or i should say when we did the nightwish episode i spoke about a couple of bands um that just clearly had a real sound that was obviously inspired by by nightwish and oceanborn um i just want to name two other bands that are clearly 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 uh heavily influenced by Angel's Cry and, and that early Angra era. Um, one band is a band called Tierra Mystica. They have a couple of albums. They have that folky power metal sound to them. And then another band who are are just, quite frankly, Angra clones, Aquaria, also from Brazil. And I think they have a new uh, album that's due out relatively soon. They had been on hiatus for some time. I mean, these bands were just so inspired by uh, that early anger sound that uh, that's why I just call it genre defining. When, when you have bands that have literally modeled their sound clearly uh, after yours, to me that that's, there's no greater testament to how uh, iconic your sound is. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. And you're, and you know, I am absolutely positive that we will talk about Holy land in the future. Um, they they definitely um, introduced more, more folk elements, more, um, you know, more South American, uh, like musical elements to, to their style. Um, which I think that those two bands you just named, they probably are a little bit closer to that Holy Land era of Angra. I feel like, but, um, but yeah, like, I, I don't know. I, I, I could sit here for another hour and talk about like each song one at a time about how much I, I might even go and listen to it again tomorrow. I just, it's just like, it's just so it, it's like, it gets better. Like every time you listen to it, you might notice something that you didn't notice the last time. I mean, it, it's just, Oh my God. Every song I, I, I always think of when I hear that opening riff to streets of tomorrow, I think of snowy immediately. Because uh, of a, like a mixtape that he made, like I like every every song has a memory. Like uh, it's just and it brings you back. At least for me, it really does bring me, bring me back to like 1998. Just because of you know where I was when I got the album, as I had mentioned, it's it's it, it's like certain certain albums bring you back in time. This is one of those albums for me. So with uh, uh, with that that being said, I mean uh, <laughs> after all the uh, after all the positive words, uh, where do you? Where do you rank this album on a scale of one to ten? This, this to me, uh, this this is as good as it gets, and and I'll just tie this into, and, and I'll give you your number. I'll, I'll just say, let, let let me say this: uh, picking between Angels Cry and Holy Land is like picking between pizza and steak, right? They're just phenomenal, and and it's just a question of which one do you like better on a given day. I am partial to Angels Cry. To me, it is their. It's their magnum opus, and you know if I had to rate them both on a scale of one to ten, they may get the same exact nine point five rating, which that's that's what I'm giving it a nine point five because it's one of the best power metal discs of all time. But when I have to go reach and pick one to listen to, I always seem to go back to Angels Cry, despite the fact that Holy Land has some of their absolute best songs like Carolina the Fourth and Make Believe, and and, and that's a story for another day, but because of the fact that I always reach for this album, I have to give it the nine five and say it's their best work. What about you? Uh, well, there was definitely a time where in the angels cry versus Holy land argument, I was team Holy land. I'm not anymore. <laughs> um, you've converted to it. You've you. converted. Yeah. Yes. I'm, I'm now on team angels cry. Uh, I, got <laughs> my, I, I traded it in, got my red, my red Jersey. 
It's kind of like when you get moved from SmackDown to Raw. Um, it's, it, it's, I think it's just, it's like a fine wine. It's just aged. It's just aged so well, like over the years. So I'm team angels cry and I don't, I can't not give this album a perfect 10. I mean, there's, it's wow. to me, it's pretty much the, like as perfect of an the album. Perfect. As a, uh, there's not, a, there's not like when I, when I talked about ocean born, I think I mentioned that there was maybe one song I wasn't crazy about. This album does not have that one song. song, not even that's one song. That's like, Oh, it's, Oh, it's good. Like all the other songs are great, but you know, uh, evil warning is just okay. Like, no, every, song on this album is an absolute to me is an absolute classic i will not argue with you i I think that we're splitting hairs if we really want to get into 9.5 versus 10 this is a masterpiece uh go listen to it and then go listen to it again because you you will if you've never heard this disc and, and do yourself do yourself a favor and listen to it um that being said let's talk about next week shall we um we're gonna go back in time i i don't know if the love fest is going to continue next week, because we're going, we're going to, uh, <laughs> when I, when I decided on an album for next week, I, I really wanted to talk about something, which honestly, I don't know that I love as much as I used to. And, and I definitely think I found one. I wasn't looking for an album that I didn't like, but I was looking for something to just see how it aged. So I would invite you to get out your fuzzy boots and your, your broadsword. We're going to go listen to some old man of war. We're gonna go listen to "Fighting the World" from 1987. Oh boy, that's that's interesting. I, man, I, I I don't remember the last time I would have sat down and listened to that album start to finish. I'm sure I've heard, you know, individual tracks because there are so many good songs on that album. Um, yeah, I actually no, that's a lie. My iTunes says I last listened to the album in full in April of 2019, so it's been okay. over a year. But um, I haven't listened to this album in over a decade. It's yeah. probably closer to 15 years. So I, I want to go back and, and revisit, um, you know, a classic Man of War disc. Um, in full disclosure, I don't know if I'm going to enjoy this nearly the way I used to when I first heard it. So we'll see what happens. I, I want to give it a, I want to give it another chance. It's just I think that part of me there's a reason why I haven't listened to this in 15 years, but we'll we will see and, and we'll leave that um, to next week. Well, but, it, it's, uh, until- in its defense, it doesn't have Pleasure Slave on it, so it can't be that bad. Well, that's, that's, that, I mean, listen, you, you, Kings of Metal may be a perfect album, but then there's Pleasure Sleep, right? So it, 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 it it's, uh, it's definitely, definitely, definitely a, definitely a different, uh, different feel with, with that one. Um, this one, this one has its share of, uh, unique tracks. It's, 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 it's all over the place. That, that much I do remember. Um, but we'll, 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 we'll give it a full, we'll give it a full week of, uh, of listens and we'll, we'll come back to it and talk about it next week. Uh, again, we appreciate the likes and the follows. Uh, we invite you to reach out to us if you have any questions or suggestions. And uh, with that, we bid you adieu, and we will see you uh, next week for Man of Wars Fighting the World. Take it easy. Thanks, everybody.